No, it's not because the aperture is oval. That's actually a side effect, a very important one though. Buckle up, this is gonna get a little bit complicated. Hi, John Hetz from FilmmakerIQ.com. A while back, someone on Twitter added me with one of his friends asked, why is it that anamorphic lenses create oval shaped bouquet? Having wondered this myself, I shot back, well, that seems like a great idea for a video. Now here's the thing. We all know that spherical lenses create bokeh in the shape of their entrance pupil. In fact, that's how I created this image using a cutout aperture in the shape of a question mark. Now, since the entrance pupil of an anamorphic lens looks like a vertically oriented oval, then it would make sense that the bokeh would retain that oval shape. If I just put an oval aperture on a spherical lens, I will get oval bokeh. But this is on an image that has yet to be unsqueezed. When stretched back out, shouldn't the shape of the bouquet return to a round circle? And even more damning evidence, take a look at this anamorphic adapter for a cell phone. It looks like it has an oval aperture, but when we use it to photograph the setup, we get bouquet that is round or actually slightly wider horizontally. What's going on here? After a few hours of reading and reading, I realized that any answer to the anamorphic lenses wasn't going to be straightforward. So much so, that's taken me the better part of a year to build the case. That and other things got in the way. Now, I'm not a trained optical designer. I haven't even dealt with lenses in any physics classes. My background with lenses was developing the demos for the Science and History of Lenses video, card in the corner, hopefully, and I'm not going to deal with any major math in this video. Instead, I'm gonna rely on calculators and visual diagrams. So this video is not scientific proof. This is merely a 30,000 foot or maybe 10,000 foot bird's eye view of what's going on. I'm going to work in easy mode and treat every bit of glass in my demonstration as absolutely perfect and ignore any aberrations there are. I defer all that to real lens designers in the real world. But if you want a TLDW version, here it is. Shooting anamorphic actually means you are shooting two different focal lengths at the same time. One for the horizontal and a different focal length for the vertical. Different focal lengths have different depths of field. Since the vertical focal length is longer, the image has a shallower depth of field along the vertical axis or bigger blur, hence the oval shape bokeh. Now let's get into the weeds and build up the case piece by piece. Whether we're working with a really high-end all-in-one system where both parts are designed to work in tandem or a simple cell phone anamorphic, it's helpful to think of an anamorphic system as two separate parts. There's a take-up lens, which is a typical everyday spherical lens, and then there's an anamorphic element. Now, since spherical lens section pretty much is self-explanatory, let's focus on that anamorphic element, which is what puts the squeeze on the footage. Now, there are two ways of accomplishing this squeeze, at least as far as I know. One way is to use prisms to skew the image. This is sort of like looking at a projection from an off angle. This prism system has been used in the camera system in the past, including a home version called Vistascope. But as I understand it, prism technique isn't as easy to focus, so it's used more for projector setups with fixed focal distances. But I'm sure many modern lenses also utilize prisms in some form. The other way is the refraction technique, and these use cylindrical lenses. Now let's back up and talk about the basic lens concept. A spherical lens is called that because the lens is a portion of the curved surface of a hypothetical sphere. A cylindrical lens is the lens that is a portion of the surface of a hypothetical cylinder. Unlike spherical lenses that bend light so that it focuses on a point in the middle of the hypothetical sphere, Cylindrical lenses only bend light along one axis, creating a line, a two-dimensional axis of the cylinder. If this is still a bit confusing, try thinking of the lens cross-section. If we take a cross-section of a cylinder lens powered axis, it looks like a standard spherical lens. But if we take a cross-section of the non-powered axis, it looks like a standard flat piece of glass, a planar lens. So you can think of a cylinder lens as acting as a spherical lens in say the horizontal axis, but having no effect in the vertical axis. 
but just having one single cylinder lens isn't enough. To demonstrate, I set up this fat beam laser and a magnifying glass. With this setup, I can get the magnifying glass to focus the light into a single point, much to the chagrin of countless ants throughout history. But watch now as I put a cylindrical concave lens in front of that magnifying glass as a simple anamorphic lens combination. Now I can no longer focus the laser beam. Instead, as I move the focusing plane closer and further away from the lens, the light goes from being a sharp horizontal line to a blurry circle and then to a sharp vertical line. And by the way, this is the basis for the streaks you see in anamorphic lenses, but that's another story. This real world example is a demonstration of astigmatism. And yes, that's the same concept when we go to the optometrist. We have two separate focus points, one for the horizontal and one for the vertical. What we want to do is get the two focus points to align and focus the image along both axes. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to turn to a ray tracing application here using Ray Optics Simulator, which is free online. I'm not making any claims that what I'm designing here is exactly how the real anamorphic lenses work, but I think this will demonstrate what's going on. Let's start with a basic setup. I have two beams with collimated or parallel rays. This represents light from infinity, kind of like our fat beam laser. The top represents the vertical axis where the only thing affecting the direction of the rays is the take-up lens. Here, the cylindrical lens isn't doing anything. The bottom represents the powered axis of the anamorphic element. Here, I'm using a concave lens with a negative focal length in order to stretch out that incoming light ray and get a wider shot. Now notice how the light focuses and produces an image at two different places. What we want to do is get the image to focus at the same distance on both of these axes. And to do that, we add a second cylindrical lens with a positive focal length. Then by manipulating the second lens and the distance from the first cylindrical lens, we can get this powered axis to focus the same distance as the non-powered axis, thereby correcting the astigmatism in the system. And there you have it, the most basic anamorphic element. That's pretty much the idea behind these cell phone anamorphic lenses. But here's the kicker. Look at the angle of the rays after they leave the second lens. They're identical. So as we move the sensor back from the focus plane at infinity to focus on something closer, we're going to get a blur that is equal on both the horizontal and the vertical axis. No matter where we move our focus plane, the bouquet from infinity will always be round. And when we unsqueeze a round bokeh, we get horizontal ovals. So that explains cell phone anamorphic lenses. They are set to focus at infinity, which makes the anamorphic element a focal, meaning the anamorphic element has no focal length or that the focal length is infinity. The problem with that is any light that's coming from closer than infinity will result in some kind of astigmatism on the focus plane. As you can see in this light ray simulator, these point lights, which have diverging light rays instead of parallel rays, focus at different distances, even though the light from infinity focuses at the same distance. Now for cell phones, which have incredibly small focal length lenses and resulting in very, very deep depth of field, that's really not an issue. The astigmatism is smaller than the circle of confusion but that won't work on a larger format and we still haven't gotten to oval bokeh yet. But what I need to do is make a more sophisticated model in the simulator. I'm going to start with two point lights. Point lights have diverging rays. This simulates the light coming from an object that is some nominal distance away. Then I'm going to add beam lights with parallel light rays, which represent a collimated light coming from infinity. On the lens side, I'll have two different versions, one using the ideal lens with an aperture behind the lens. The settings I'm using here are a bit arbitrary, but the focal length and the aperture as measured from the front of the lens makes this about an f2.0. My second version of the setup will use the exact same lens, but I'll put an anamorphic element in front. The version without these two front elements represents the vertical view, and the version with the elements represents the horizontal view. Now I'm going to focus onto something closer than infinity, these two point lights. And to do that, we'll need to readjust the anamorphic element to correct for the astigmatism. I've done so here already. Now, this model tells us two things. First, I can compare the distance between the two focus lights, determine the anamorphic squeeze factor. 
And when I measure it, I get about 72 units on the non-powered side and 26 units on the powered side. This means this anamorphic squeeze is about 0.36. The inverse of 0.36 is 2.77. So to stretch this anamorphic image back, we'll need to scale it horizontally to 277% of the original size. Next, I can measure the size of the blur generated from the beam light, which again represents light from infinity. So this would be the out of focus bokeh circles. On the power side, I measure about 10 units. But on the non-powered side, I get 78 units. Now, what is the ratio between the powered and non-powered for the bokeh? It's 0.12. The squeeze ratio of our image was 0.36, but the blur was squeezed by 0.12. Now, eagle-eyed mathletes and Rain Man might recognize that 0.12 is actually really close to 0.36 squared which is 0 0.1296. In fact, that's exactly what's going on here. Never mind the rounding errors trying to eyeball a measurement in this free optic stimulator. So there it is. The anamorphic element squeezes the image by a certain factor, but then squeezes the out of focus objects or bokeh by that factor squared. Let's take this back into the real world. Here I put a two times anamorphic projector lens on a 180 millimeter f2.8 lens in a homebrew anamorphic lens combination. And if we look at the shot before de-squeezing and measure the bokeh, we see that the ratio is about 4.22 height to width. That's about two squared. In fact, it's 2.05 squared. The extra bit maybe because my homebrew setup isn't exactly two times and the point lights aren't exactly at infinity, but this is close enough to prove the point. If we step back from the weirdness of anamorphics, we see this happening in our everyday world of spherical lenses. If I replace that anamorphic lens with a regular spherical zoom lens and take a shot at 80 millimeters using T4.4, and then take another shot using 40 millimeters using, also using T4.4, we see the angle of view doubling, but the bokeh decreasing by two squared. If we just crop in that 40 millimeter shot so that it matches the field of view of the 80 millimeter shot, we can see the bokeh of the 40 millimeter is still about half as small as the 80 millimeter. Now the math may not make it exactly half, but we're really, really close. This also explains why even those smaller sensor cameras that actually have shallower depth of field than their larger sensor counterparts, our experience is that the, they have deeper depth of field because the change in the focal length is squared when it comes to the depth of field and the resulting bokeh. But then what about the oval shape of the aperture that everyone thinks is causing the oval bokeh? How is that a side effect? Now notice that in all my demonstrations, I never once changed the size of the aperture. The physical opening remained constant regardless of the axis. It is round. But the F number isn't the actual physical opening. The F number is the ratio of the focal length divided by the aperture as measured from the front of the lens. Now, because the anamorphic squeezes the light coming from the scene horizontally, it also squeezes the view of the aperture from the front horizontally, the light coming back out from the lens. Now, this isn't just some unimportant side effect. It means that even though the focal length changed along the powered axis by the anamorphic squeeze factor, the F number stays constant because the size of the aperture when viewed from the front of the lens also gets squeezed by that same anamorphic squeeze factor. They cancel each other out. So the F number remains constant. And because it is constant, there is a difference in the depth of field and bokeh. Now let's say you wanted to get rid of the oval bokeh, but still have the anamorphic element. One way to do that is to move the aperture in front of the anamorphic element. Therefore, the F number doesn't get affected by the anamorphic squeeze. We would still have oval bokeh in the raw footage, but when we go to de-squeeze it, it gets canceled out and then we're back to the round bokeh. Now, some anamorphic lenses like the Ingenue Optimo have this feature. I can't say for the exact design, but I think they put the anamorphic element so that it doesn't affect the entrance pupil and they may actually use prisms as well. Now, since we're talking about anamorphics, let me just add a couple other notes worth pointing out. 
In the early days of anamorphic films in the mid 50s, there was a technical issue called anamorphic mumps. When you get closer to the lens, you need to move those cylinder lenses in the anamorphic element closer together to eliminate astigmatism. But when you move those elements closer together, you decrease the anamorphic squeeze factor. So when you go to de-squeeze it, you end up with people who are wider than they should be. And it's not for the normal reasons why people are wider than they should be. This is also why older anamorphic lenses have a pretty large minimum focusing distance. You can't get those elements to line up just right and still maintain that anamorphic squeeze. Now, modern lens designs in anamorphic lenses have come a long way to addressing these issues. They add additional astigmatism, fighting elements, and prisms, and a bunch of other stuff that is well, well beyond my current understanding. But this question did take me down a path of exploring the possibilities of anamorphics. And I even discovered an optical way to make the lens wobble effect that I've seen in hundreds of old movies. Just reorient the anamorphic lens. It's such a common technique that I've seen in cinema and I never ever thought about how they did it. So that's it. That's why bokeh on anamorphic lenses are oval two different focal lengths. I am so relieved to finally put this topic, which has haunted me for the better part of a year, to bed. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, do whatever YouTube wants you to do. Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Help me figure out more mysteries of optics and filmmaking. These guys have been awesome, by the way. Thank you so much. And don't forget to pick up your very own official Filmmaker IQ merch at the merch store below. So all that's left for me to say is to go out there and anamorphically squeeze something great. Go make something great. I'm John Hess, and I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.